Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And this feels like catch-up, but the sort for which I've got just enough breathing room to get because releases have actually slowed down a little bit this month. Thank God. So that means we got a lot of big entries, plus a few nice indie surprises. So let's get on the pulse. Okay, we got 10 albums on the docket. Let's first start off with from Shiksa Genesis. Genesis. Okay, I've been sitting on this one longer than I've wanted, but really, when the sound here is so distinct, I knew I could not wait much longer. The easy way to describe Shiksa is called them desert rock, but their melodic tones and especially their rhythm section are soaked in prog adjacent psychedelia, based off of a Peruvian style of cumbia called chica. And when you consider that two of their members were once in the long rutting and utterly warped Howie Gelb project, Giant Sand, that might give you a bit of an idea where their sound is. Now, the other thing to highlight is that many of these guys are industry lifers. I mean, their drummer worked with Alice Cooper and Bob Dylan in the 90s. So it's got the feel of, we've been playing alongside folks for a while now, we've done a ton of session work, let's venture off into our own weird territory. Well, anyway, I checked out their debut, I mostly liked it, and I found a lot of the textures intriguing enough to give this a shot, and yeah, I wound up liking this a lot as well. Again, half the appeal here is an act like this, it comes in its description. Imagine the intersection between late 80s prog rock, sophistipop, and the snarled side of the late Ennio Morricone, or if Muse played Knights of Sidonia completely straight instead of a manic pastiche. It's worth hearing because you're not going to hear anything else like it in 2021. But you know what? Even beyond novelty, there is a lot to appreciate here. The percussion is by far the biggest draw on a lot of the texture and complexity, but the angular guitar phrases lean into the peculiar your atmosphere remarkably well. And while I did find myself wishing the bass lines were a little bit more defined in the mix, I was shocked by how well the synths blended and accented to create the uncanny psychedelic atmosphere, well accented by the husky interplay of Brian Lopez and Gabriel Sullivan's vocals. But what caught me off guard was that this album isn't just pure atmosphere building, and it very well could have been. The big strike that can be leveled against a lot of industry lifer acts is that even being stacked with all the talents, they can't often deliver the distinctive, punchier songs that would have got them their own unique spotlight. But Genesis proves that this band does actually have some hooks, and it ends really strongly. Now, this would be where I would go to the writing, and if I were to highlight a weakness of this album, it would probably come with some of the lyrics, which circle around a lot of mystical, quasi-psychedelic traditions and finding connections to the land that add a lot of literary texture to a fair number of moments that are considerably more lewd. And sure, nothing wrong with that, but it does lend the album an ambling, scattered quality that can feel a little bit thematically diffuse. Yes, I know that's the point, but it did get a bit distracting for me. That being said, I'm inclined to call this great anyway. Not only have I not heard that much like this, it's so textured and catchy that I really did enjoy it. Late 8 out of 10, you probably missed this one, Give it a listen. Next up, the self-titled album from Vivian Leva and Riley Cal. Let's not talk about the plans we made. Why don't we just sit and watch the sunlight fade? Yeah, I'm making an effort to get a little bit more timely with my indie country reviews, so let's talk about this one. You might recognize Vivian Leva for her 2018 breakthrough that got some critical acclaim from those in the know, deservingly so, I should add. And you know what, I was late to a lot of the projects in 2018, but Time Is Everything is remarkably charming and a lot of the bluegrass and folks inflected edges. But Riley Calcagno is someone I didn't recognize. Apparently he's a classically trained strings musician and this is their self-titled team up and Honestly, again, I like this a decent bit. Leva takes most of the vocal leads, although Calcagno's harmonies are solid. He's got one song where he takes lead. The two have 
okay interplay, and for a generally warm, pleasantly charming bit of acoustic country folk with some familiar melodies and some really nice touches of strings and pedal steel, the fiddle in particular sounds phenomenal, this goes down extremely easy. And there's really not a lot more to add. This sort of formula and team up feels very tried and true. And while the two have some good chemistry, I don't really think they deliver anything that surpasses or transcends any expectations. And that led me to wonder where there could have been a little more, and I think some of it might come in the writing. Part of this is, again, the missed opportunity of you got a duo and not making any use of any lyrical interplay, but I do think it runs a bit deeper. The album seems to want to explore the little tensions in the relationships that are often buried just out of picture, especially when they are ending, or they really should be, the insecurities of infidelity or just thinking that it could probably be happening, a lingering sense of emotional distance, only further emphasized by how upbeat and chipper a lot of these arrangements are. And it certainly feels mature and realistic, but this is also not the first album this year that's going into this territory and not clicking as strongly as I would like for me. And I think it comes down a bit to wishing for a little more lyrical detail, put a bit more meat on the bones to the storytelling instead of playing for a broader universality. Now that's not saying there aren't some songs that still shine through on the arrangement and delivery alone. You got Hollowed Hearts, Red Hen, Love and Chains, those are probably my favorites, which is why this is getting a very strong 7 out of 10. But as an indie country gem that's attracting some critical acclaim, I just wish I could appreciate it a little bit more. That's all. Next up from the Anchoress, The Art of Losing. So here's a bit of advice when you recommend a band. If you're gonna make comparisons to genre-breaking legends of the format and thus set the bar very high, it does no favors to the artist when I discover they don't remotely reach that level. Such was the case for The Anchoress, the project of singer-songwriter Catherine Ann Davies, who's worked with the Manic Street Preachers, and I was told drew a lot of comparisons to certain goth acts, and more specifically Kate Bush, but my experience listening to her debut was closer to a watered Dan Florence and the Machine, or Regina Spector, except minus a lot of the literary chops, the raw delivery, and the intense production. It felt like the accessible brand of what this sort of indie pop or piano rock could be, with moments closer to a cross between maybe Amy Lee and Christina Perry. So even with the assertion that the sophomore album was a lot better, I had reservations, and uh, honestly it might sound a little bit more refined around the edges, with Davies delivering a more convincing and impassioned performance, but I'm still not all that impressed. Again, maybe it's overexposure to this brand of sultry, faux noir presentation from the 90s and 2000s, where I could point to a half dozen different acts doing this better. Maybe it's the synthesizers that clash with the piano, strings, and the murky slurry of guitars in a really ugly way. This is a self-produced effort, and I hate to say it shows more often than not in the inconsistent mix blending on multiple songs in both the vocals and in how it's clean enough to be pop, but not really polished enough to really punch, but I think my biggest issue comes in the clash between the writing style and a lot of the presentation. I mean, Florence Welsh and Fiona Apple can make their blunter, less detailed moments in their poetry really work, because they're such raw, magnetic forces of personality, whereas acts like Kate Bush, Nico Case, and Regina Spector, they can weave such tapestries with their words and back it up with real dramatic presence. Where I struggle with the Anchoress is that, despite a lot of heavy subject matter of circling loss, processing grief, sexual abuse, and depression, how the performance it's kind of underwhelming, and how frustratingly underweight a lot of the poetry feels. It lacks in details, and in multiple moments, it slides towards melodrama on the cusp of being painfully cliched. But then we get 5AM, a vividly painted song about sexual assault and miscarriage, and I have heard and felt a lot of terrifyingly potent connections to songs about this sort of abuse in the past couple of years, and I don't want to invalidate her expression of this sort of very real pain, but this performance did not connect in the same way that Better by Jesse Bones or The Dress by Emily Scott Robinson or conversely For Her by Fiona Apple did. And it's sadly for a lot of the same reasons that this really falls short for me and that it feels very thinly sketched and underproduced, not to mention a lot of songs I've heard done before done better, especially if you look anywhere outside of the mainstream. I mean, I can make a very cheap quip with the title of this album kind of set me up here, but truth be told, 
I was never won over to begin with. Five out of ten. I was really trying to like this more. Next up from Las Vegas, Godspeed. You're dying to There's something that soured me on indie rock faster than listening to so many 2000s acts riding on the obvious coattails of the flagrant inspirations of the 80s and 90s and making the equivalent of commercial bait. And I've gone off about this at length a couple times now in this series when I reviewed that pointless Bombay Bicycle Club album from last year, that springs to mind. But Glass Vegas is in that territory too that's leaning way too hard on a lot of late 80s shoegaze with a very light smattering of post-punk that can't remotely back up their tepid attempts at bombast and conscious subject matter in the vocals or writing. At least the bands that worked from that era, they understood what grooves were or they could competently mix a lot of their guitars and their drums. Well, anyway, for some reason, someone requested their most recent album after their early 2010s hype long ago faded. It's a bit of a comeback here, and, uh, well, credit to them. This is the first Glass Vegas album that was actually a little bit interesting. Not because of the sound or the delivery, unfortunately. Frontman James Allen has either never had the dramatic intensity that his thick brogue has, or has been really positioned well in the mix to really grab me. And the sound is so as slavishly derivative as ever, this time pushing a shoegaze tech textures towards a very specific side of synth-inflected gothic post-punk that you'd hear across chunks of the 80s. And there's a messy aimlessness to a lot of these compositions that leave them a lot less catching or striking than they really should be, flagrantly evident in some of the gauzy synths that are really poorly mixed on top, or whenever they attempt a driving Sisters of Mercy-esque crescendo with all the organs and the backing choirs, and once again, they really cannot sell it, especially when the mixing just turns to crap on cuts like In My Mirror. Well, you know what? On some level, when you actually dig up some of the lyrics, it's kind of the point, especially in the stronger first few songs. The band has described this project like a meandering, desperate daydream on a very long drive, which given the bleakness on display, it often gives the feeling of a nascent death wish. And man alive, I wish I felt like this added up to anything more. Normally when the pictures are this impressionistic and scattershot in the imagery, there is something sharper or more visceral or more profound beneath this, but this album almost feels lost in its own warbling stylism without much to give its lovelorn, wandering moments any sort of purpose or real punch. And I gotta say, the style isn't even very well executed courtesy of some of the stock horror attempts that don't fit either. So yeah, this might have a little bit more flair than their earlier work. I get why folks might like this, but once again, Glass Vegas falls painfully flat for me. Light 5 out of 10, if you know these genres, you've heard better. Next up from Quatica, from me to you. Give me the shit out of nowhere, yeah, I didn't mean to scare you, bro. Used to look around, they like, where he go? Now they see me everywhere, they like, there he go. Not gonna lie, the buzz I heard around this rapper was kind of perplexing to me. Hailed as one of those white YouTube rappers that's actually worth paying attention to and can pull together some solid production. And, okay, let me say he might have better taste for instrumentals than some of his actual bars. Because in going through his entire back catalog, he reminded me way too much of falling between Trap Era Logic and Josh A in both his flat delivery, a lot of corniness, and a reliance on technical skill and double time over actual content with real impact or insight. Now granted, I was told this album was the big leap forward for him, a real breakthrough, and honestly I'm kind of conflicted on this one too. On the one hand, there are elements that I actually do like about this, like Quatica's solid, if derivative, technical skills as a rapper, an okay running content concept surrounding the ascent of a mountain, representing his climb up in the game, and if he wanted to make a project that's as chilly, expansive, and actively hostile as such a climb, you can argue this is in that territory, and it's got a certain level of real polish in order to sell it. But there are three major problems, the first coming in how I think his singing voice is pretty weak and underwhelming, and his screaming's not much better, and the second issue comes with the production. Yes, it can be kind of hard-hitting with the buzzed-out, slamming percussion, the splashes of some clumsily mixed dubstep, and the desaturated bombast off the brittle guitars, the wheedling glassy synths, and some of the strings flourishes, 
but when you combine some limited melodic hooks and an instrumental with a pretty long runtime for the album and not at all much in the way of subtlety, it starts feeling a little stale, with the sonic roots of the clunky sounds of a very specific early 2010s brand of online music that I'd argue has not aged all that well, and our third issue is that Quatica's content doesn't really help. Yes, I know this is tied to a lot of modern tropes and angsty emo rap, but it also ties to two problems I hear a lot from the YouTube rap scene, the first being a lot of raging insecurity about it and its online roots, which on the one hand fuels the underdog narrative, but on the other, I've heard this arc from a lot of white boy YouTube rappers, and attempting to flex with your numbers will never not feel hollow to me, and being self-aware about it doesn't help either if you don't expand off it. Unfortunately with Quatica, what probably stands out the most amidst all of his double time flows and all the flexing are some of the cornier punchlines with the Lion King and TikTok and QAnon and Ben Shapiro, which you can mostly get away with on this platform, but are really damn distracting when the rest of the production and the content is trying to scream so hard, take me seriously. No, if anything, Quatica reminds me way too much of NF in that in his effective monochromatic approach of epic presentations and flows, he doesn't wind up saying enough in order to really back up all that bombast, and it feels like so much intensity that doesn't have a deeper root or any sense of groove. And while I think the production has more distinctive flavor and atmosphere, I just hear so much work for something that's so humorless and dreary and lacking a lot of resonant impact, and it just gives me no incentive to make this climb again. Or let's put it another way. It's not a good sign when the best song on the album is It's All a Game, where he hits a nihilistic breaking point and realizes that none of it matters. Yikes. 5 out of 10. I know it's not for me. It was closer to working than I expected, but still not great. Next up from Igloo Ghost, Leyline Eel. This is one of those cases where I completely get what this English producer is trying to do. A frenetic fusion of glitch hop and bubblegum bass with a distinctive video game music touch to the chord structures and production, as well as entirely too much chipmunk vocals, so, so I even have to tell you that it's not really my thing. Now granted, I mentioned some of that when I covered a single in my song review series on IGTV, now crossing over to TikTok, but in listening to the debut it just did not click for me. A full force squeaking approach that gave me a headache in record time. It didn't really showcase much in the way of dynamics to add variance to the frantic stuttering progression, so it kind of ran together. And on the sophomore album, well, here's the thing. I can imagine fans might be a little bit torn on this one, because it's slower, it's more refined and methodical, tuning back some of the video game influences for elegant strings passages and more defined vocals beyond all the pitch-shifted howling that shows that someone might have been making a lot of sidelong glances at what Bjork and Arca have been doing the past couple of years. And maybe a smattering of looks at visible cloaks and object as well. But I will say there is something distinctly childlike to the approach of the album, and I don't mean that as an insult at all. Even beyond the children's choir on Amu Disc Mod, you can tell that this album is trying to capture some of that playful sense of wonderment at a strange, larger, inexplicable world that's really so much bigger than yourself, as the synths will spiral and contort against the shimmering mix. And while on a textural level, the glass keening tones somehow keep finding the precise shrill frequency to not work nearly as well as I could hope, like on Pure Grey Circle and Zones You Can't See, I recognize it's an issue I have with a lot of this material, as this sound palette, really as it is, I have these issues in Hyperpop too, and Igloo Ghost production does craft a distinctive world where I can hear the appeal, even if reading through the attached faux scientific reports on Igloo Ghost's website feels like I'm being drawn into the sort of overwritten, quasi-futuristic campaign setting for an RPG, where the creator got a little too into the lore and less into the actual story being told. Hey, we've all been there. Now, the odd thing is that after multiple listens, this felt like an album that I respected a fair bit more than I outright liked, which feels kind of weird for a project that's clearly targeting a specific emotional wavelength that's nowhere near as detached. Really, it's kind of the definition of a project that on an aesthetic level just really isn't for me, even if I think it is better than the past one and it's got its moments. Extreme Light 6 out of 10, it might be for you, so... Give it a chance. Next up from Godspeed You, Black Emperor, God's P at State's End. <laughs> So the next 
next couple of releases we're going to talk about, they honestly feel a little bit like Music Critic on hard mode. And honestly, when it comes to this Canadian post-rock collective, known for genre-breaking crescendos, sound collages, and a hard leftist deconstruction of broken systems that can still find the towering humanity and abstract transcendence, kind of understandable. Honestly, I'm a little bit surprised it took me this long to cover this particular group. I would like to point at their slightly underwhelming 2010s work, and I do include that 2012 comeback there, unpopular opinion. Hell, on the majority of days, I also include the Steve Albini produced Yankee UXO. But the truth is more that, especially on the scope of their ideas and pedigree, with F sharp, A sharp, Infinity being legit excellent, and Lift Your Skinny Fist Like Antennas to Heaven being a full on classic, I was kind of a bit intimidated to fully dive in. But all right, this was cited as a return to form, and well, how do you talk about an instrumental post rock collective who have been making music heralding the collapse of broken systems? now composing for the moment instead of being prophetic. Now, I'll admit these are not passages that scream out, we told you so, so much as even we are a little bit stunned that we are at this point, and as such, we are going to try to rise to the occasion. And indeed, for as much as this album will build towards swelling crescendos and tempo shifts backed up by waves of guitar and sawing strings, they almost seem a little bit staggered in doing so. Yeah, the raw rhythm guitar texture is better than ever, and the grooves are probably the closest to ever earning their shambling and explosive swans influence, except this time it's trying to break across a haunted and an increasingly desiccated landscape. A lot of fractured radio ambiance and fuzz, that's been filling their work for years now, but here it's less of a muzzle and more of an unstable background for the melodic phrases to try and claw themselves forth, not quite reaching the sample majesty of their earliest material, but that was built from the world we knew. With every ragged tremble here, this album is all the more conscious of the unsteady foundation of the now. But perhaps hopeful in what might come forth? Kind of tough to say. The final piece has such stunning, aching strings, but not quite a melodic resolution, especially coming off of what might be one of the most penultimate feeling cuts that they've ever had in a suite before. But that is the odd thing. This is an album with definite flickers of transcendence, but the foundation feels more insubstantial, enough that I found myself longing for some of those odd field recordings and the tapes that peppered their earlier work. Even if they were non sequiturs, they added a little bit more here, and no, opening with garbled remnants of military code, or the field recording of echoing gunfire, a little too ham-fisted to really be effective. But you know what, this is probably then the most I've liked a Godspeed You Black Emperor album since their early stuff, but I'm not quite pulled back in as often as I would want to be. And for an album where the abstraction is built for these times, doesn't fully stick. Solid 7 out of 10, definitely worth hearing, not their best. Next up from Armand Hammer and the Alchemist. Yeah, man, the whole human race. I'm almost done. God be praised. I'm almost done. Every debt gets paid. Okay, look, I just needed time for this one. I've reviewed Arm & Hammer a couple of times now, and even with production from The Alchemist, for what might count as a commercial breakthrough for an act like this, I knew I would really need some time to sit and digest where Billy Woods and Elusa were gonna take this, especially after Shrines was increasingly scattered and abstract. So let me start by saying this. I I think I get what Arm & Hammer were trying to do on this album, which features some of their brightest and most melodic presentations to date, even more than Shrines and might be considered kind of approachable with the production. And like with Shrines, the density feels more freewheeling and abstract than ever before, at least on the surface. But what I found really interesting is that it really does continue the thematic arc from Shrines, where the duo's continued ascent is more at the forefront. They're finding a lot of success in the pursuit a black excellence, embodying a cultural legacy and a spiritual centering, either intentionally obscured for its own mystique, or violently shoved out of sight or attacked by white American society. But all the while, they're still conscious of their own valuable humanity and the larger surreal things they don't know, with more questions of legacy than you might expect, with Billy Woods often the most conscious of it, as he slides in our limited comprehension of death and his contempt at the uncaring capitalist system into many 
any of these pictures. My favorite example probably comes with that layered MF Doom reference on Black Sunlight. But hell, on Wishing Bad, Curly Castro's venom on his verse is considerably more direct. And quite like Chris falling on Chicarones, targeting how even hashtag Black Lives Matter can be corporatized and lose its edge for driving tangible economic change, especially for someone who's trading violence for violence. Yeah, all these are kind of messy and loaded conversations that are not easily approached, especially not in mixed company, because they can impact their own personal arcs of success. And you get the impression that the album title and cover are preemptively pushing away the folks who are not equipped to engage with them. Although the participation of the Alchemist kind of short circuits that from being more approachable of an album. But you know what? In a system that is structurally racist, you can't blame their second guessing or just those who just choose to get what's theirs at least for now. And I really wish I loved more of the production. Now don't get me wrong, the smoother tones, the sample selection, they make a lot of sense for a project that's clearly dreaming bigger, not knotted into a lot of the distorted foxholes they used to. But we're a lot of the buttery feel of the Alchemist's rougher beats and lo-fi samples that always feel a little bit too clean. It might have made some more sense for Freddie Gibbs's relaxed gangster rap or something out of the Griselda camp. I'm not quite sure they flatter Arm & Hammer's rougher, more abstract, edges. Hell, granted, I had this niggling feeling back with shrines going in this direction, but here it feels more uncanny, with the lighter, melodic, horn and woodwind inflected developments, and the hooks from our duo that are not quite up to pace. I don't know, I still think this is on the cusp of legit greatness, and I'll repeat what I say with every Backwoods Studio project, and then my opinion will probably fluctuate half a dozen times. I literally came back to write parts of this review after giving it another couple listens a few days later. But you know, for two rappers, that said on record they don't want to get stale, I think they've got to take another step. And that next step probably comes in expanding their song craft beyond the sheer bars, especially if they want to avoid some of those traps. So extremely light, 8 out of 10, still very recommended. I just think personally I prefer Paraffin and Rome a bit more. That's all. Next up from Demi Lovato, Dancing with the Devil, The Art of Starting a Almost made it to heaven, it was closer than you know. This is the sort of album I just know critics dread talking about in modern times. A pop diva who has never put out a consistently excellent project, with a powerhouse voice, often held back by a lot of clumsy writing, haphazard production, and who has been coming off of a tragic story of addiction and relapse where any criticism of the music will be interpreted by stands as an excuse for blood, and then to doctor screenshots implying that a critic said way worse than they actually did. Uh, yeah, when the doctor documentary when even Demi Lovato said she was spooked by some of the creepy intensity of her fan base. Maybe that might be a lesson for some of them to take a big step back here. But considering how disappointed I was publicly with a badly produced disaster that was Tell Me You Love Me, seriously, for as many voices who were in that room for the mixing to be mismanaged like that, it's inexcusable. I was just queuing up for my next round of backlash. I've been down this rabbit hole way too many times before, and I say all that to preface that even though I appreciate the struggle and thematic arc of the album, how Demi Lovato found sobriety and came out as pansexual after a few hellish years I would not wish on anyone, and how on average this is better than her last project, it unfortunately still reflects a lot of problems I've had with her material for years now, more in the execution than her intentions. And again, it's not just one thing. I mentioned this on Billboard Breakdown a week or so ago about Demi Lovato having a bad tendency to over-sing and rely on her volume rather than texture or raw intensity in her delivery, which is all the more apparent when she rotates through so many different producers and engineers in the course of a bloated album, and where the vast majority of them don't know how to mic or layer her voice properly so it doesn't flatten or clip out in the mix. And that's not counting the ones that drizzle a lot of wonky pitch correction all over it. And then there's the fact that despite being in pop for over a decade now, she really doesn't have her own defined sound beyond just having a huge voice, which leads to a lot of increasingly colorless Katy Perry-esque trend chasing when it comes to her instrumentals, none of which have the flavor or richness to match a project that she's clearly trying so goddamn hard to sell. And for an album that is all about a very raw, very personal struggle that she's facing, it doesn't 
feel as authentic as it really should. Now, I think this is where the blunt impact of her writing could really help, and I think there are some heartfelt moments here. The angst of feeling damaged when a partner doesn't acknowledge her on the way you don't look at me, that's a really good song. And I like how the second half of the project feels a lot looser and more playful, where it does sound like Demi Lovato is in a much better space, like on California Sober. But I gotta say it, there's also never really a moment where it coalesces into more, or where the sequencing offers any sort of good payoff. I mean, she does a really nice string-accented cover of Mad World, but it makes no sense where it's placed on the project and the back couple of songs. And again, over 19 tracks, this just runs together. It's trying for a lot of grand pop bombast, but so rarely sticks the landing in the production of the songwriting, and I'm left thinking that without sharper standout moments or some form of internal structure, this album will placate fans, but few else, especially as she's still not playing to her strengths as a performer. Strong 5 out of 10, I get the appeal, I could take or leave this one. And finally, from Brockhampton, Roadrunner, New Light, New Machine. No matter what they say about us, I know that it'll be okay. I was really nervous about this release, and I don't know why. I mean, I've got expectations that this boy band can deliver quality, but they've proven on multiple projects that they can deliver. And with more time to refine their material, that can only be a good thing, right? Or you know what, maybe it's because I remember the fever pitch of excitement around Brockhampton when they broke out in 2017, or when Sugar became a legit-ass hit, and yet this time the buzz feels weirdly muted, even despite Danny Brown and JPEG Mafia showing up on this album proper. But again, it might be diminishing returns. It is the sixth The Brock Hampton project I've reviewed in some form. We all know their formula and approach, so what do we get? Well... I gotta be honest, I have struggled a lot with this, specifically because under a certain definition, this might be Brockhampton's most accessible, or dare I even say, conventional rap album to date, and placing that in any sort of context felt uncanny as all hell. Now look, I've had weird Brockhampton opinions for years now. I think Iridescence is their best project, No Halo is their best song to date, but Iridescence is also relevant here because this album is reportedly the second part of the trilogy with that project as the first, and Ginger is an unstable outlier bridge project in order to keep the band together. And the progression really shows through first in the content. Because we are Iridescence was drawing on a much richer, kind of unstable Britpop palette for a lot of moments, this album feels like it draws a lot of influence from 90s rap and R&B. Especially a lot of those keening G-Funk synths, some heavier rap rock guitars, and the rougher percussion and bass blending, where it's not even all that surprising that Danny Brown shows up on the first song and I'm reminded a lot of his last album. But that also means, if you're expecting a lot more of the internet-driven, pop-adjacent, quirky weirdness that's made Brockhampton so distinctive before, well, it's here, but there's a grit caked up around the edges, and it makes me think that there were a lot of label notes to make this sound more accessible to the mainstream. A lot of interference that Kevin Abstract directly references on multiple songs, but also probably why there's verses from ASAP Ferg and ASAP Rocky here, and I don't think either of them have enough unique personality or content to match the MCs already here who need more verses. And that's what strikes me about this. It's not the first Brockhampton project that feels like it could fit in the mainstream, but it's the first with a lot of moments that feel actively compromised to do it. And it lends the thematic arc about bracing yourself and working through all that pain, either across the relationships, family drama, in the face of systemic racism, or in Joba's sad case, his father's suicide. It gives it all a very different air. Especially when you hear after Brockhampton's next album, which is apparently going to go more poppy, that they could actually be breaking apart for a little bit. Kind of a bit of a shame, because when it comes to the sheer songcraft, this is the band's probably most consistent album, certainly in production. And while there are no highlights that match their absolute best, it does have highlights. Yeah, I could go for more Dom verses and bareface passages, but there are some really strong, it kind of scattered moments that do hold up, often by playing into those influences influences and doing it really well. So for me, solid 7 out of 10, but like with any of my Brockhampton opinions, take them with a grain of salt. It is still worth hearing though. You should hear it. Check it out. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. I'm sure I said something that clearly annoyed you or sparked some conversation. Comments down there below. Have fun. 
Beyond that, anything else I might be able to do to pick up my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you guys want to get involved in putting albums on my schedule or in either on the Pulse or solo reviews, link to my Patreon is right over there. Please don't, you don't have to at this time, no obligation. I understand tough, times are tough right now, but if you want to, options available. But until then, I'm Mark, you're watching On the Pulse on Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.